small island in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm going to talk to you today about a homegrown idea. When I moved here to Orcas Island four years ago, I had no idea that an idea worth spreading was going to emerge from some events that were happening a few miles across the water from our new home. But that's exactly what happened. It was a small idea, but it was really 30 years in the making. And the idea is this, that we as citizens have a reasonable expectation that our policymakers will use best available science to make decisions that influence us in communities uh, across the nation. And um, it, it's a pretty simple idea, and it's based on a premise called science for the people. And that's not a new idea, but it's an idea that um, I'm developing with a new twist. And it's based really on a sense of place, and that place is Orcas Island. And for sure, this idea has been influenced on uh, my professional experience at the intersection of science and policy when I was not here on Orcas Island. But it wasn't until I moved here and I lived in this small community that um, that was the catalyst for thinking about the intersection of science and policy in a new way because the decisions that are made by policymakers have a really huge impact on our way of life. And so that's what I want to tell you a bit about today. Orcas is a really special place. It's, it's small, it's 57 square miles. To put that in context, it's about the same landmass as Staten Island. We have 4,500 uh, residents here year round, and that's about 1% of the population of Staten Island. And what's unique about Orcas and the San Juan Islands more generally is that most of the population here wasn't born here. We've, we've chosen to be here. Our economy is based largely on the environment and tourism. And so a lot of people come here to visit, and they fall in love, and they decide to move here like we did. And I know many of you in the audience um, share a similar experience. You've, you've lived very rational lives, and you have your own orca story where you have had this semi-irrational moment when you've said, I just have to be here. And then you turn your lives upside down and you eventually get here. And some of you I know are even brave enough um, to tell those stories in, in public. <laughs> um, but what's, what's important is that that sense of place is really, really important. And I've lived in other places where I was really comfortable with my anonymity. There were a lot of other people around in places like DC and California. And there were always, other people would always step up to the plate. But living in a community like this, you f I, found a place, I found a place where I could become involved in ways that make sense. And so I really feel connected here. This is my home. It's uh, really, really important. I care about things that happen here. And so because of that, this is my home. I found my voice here. And so I decided I had to use that in a, in a, in a way to help me understand what was being proposed a few miles across the water from my new home. The arrow here represents the site of a proposed Gateway Pacific Terminal, which, if built, would be the largest coal transport facility in North America. And so putting my science and policy hat on, I thought, wow, what, are the, what is really being planned here? And certainly there must be a whole host of science and technical questions that go along with this. So I and, and others um, started digging into what the story was, what was really being proposed at this site. And this is what we found out. There's a, a rich coal uh, deposit in, on the border between Wyoming and Montana. It's called the Powder River Basin. And big coal, well, many of you in the audience already know the story, but there are plans by big coal companies to strip mine 100 million tons of coal per year from this site and load it on mile and a half long trains that will travel 1,300 miles from the Powder River Basin to these uh, two proposed coal terminals in Washington State, the largest of which would be at Cherry Point, or 54 million tons of coal a year. Now, this, uh, the train route will snake through hundreds of communities, large and small, 
Spokane, along the Columbia Gorge, up through lots of, or through lots of small communities, and up through Seattle, and eventually end up at Cherry Point. Then, when they're at Cherry Point, when the coal arrives at Cherry Point, the coal would be loaded onto massive vessels called cape size vessels, single-hulled single bulkers, and shipped um, to Asia. Now, the significance of these, the size of these vessels is that these, they're called cape size because they don't fit through the Ca Panama Canal. They reach the faraway markets by going around the capes of South America and Africa. And the only way for these ships, about 450 per year, going just to Cherry Point, if this terminal is built, is around the San Juan Islands through Haro Strait and Rosario Strait. And many of, as you know, those are quite narrow and dangerous passages. And then out the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And then these, uh, these same ships would take what's called the North Pacific Great Circle Route through the Unimac Pass in Canada to Asian markets in, in South Korea and Japan uh, and, and China, and to be burned in fuel plants that aren't env as environmentally sensitive as, as ours are. So with all of this background, I, st I started to ask you, asking questions about some science and technical issues and policy issues about, uh, for example, health of workers and miners at, 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 the, uh, at the mine site. And, uh, groundwater and rivers, um, what, what would be the integrity of, of those after this strip mining um, and reclamation efforts. When, when the coal is transported, what about the impacts of coal dust and other particulates, including, and, and diesel fumes on air and water and human health? Um, when the coal gets to the port, there are a lot of implications for coal being transported on, onto the vessels and where would that coal end up? Um, as the trains are going through the, all these hundreds of communities, what are the health and safety issues and uh, emergency response issues in these communities? Um, the trains would actually go right in front of the, the major uh, professional sports complexes in Seattle. This is just a, a picture of what the uh, actual coal transport vessel looks like, the Cape size. And then there are also implications, economic implications in all kinds of communities, including the tribal communities and their, um, their customary and usual fishing grounds. So all these questions were coming to, to mind and I thought, well, surely our local officials, our state officials are going to be informed by the best, avail best available science to inform these, these uh, decisions. And I, then I started to think, well, what if there are gaps in our knowledge? How would those gaps be filled? And I looked, at the uh, federal agencies and the state agencies and the, the current me mechanisms that are already in place, including private foundations, to do kind of um, rapid response, site-specific research to fill any potential research gaps. And I realized that, well, there really isn't a mechanism for that. There are tried and true mechanisms for, for submitting proposals and getting them funded, but nothing that would quite fill this gap that I was seeing um, emerge. So what I decided to do was to test a, a new model called Science for the People, and specifically an organization I started called Research Now. And it's, has, it's, a, it's a model, it's a three-part model, a pretty simple model. And it has, uh, the three parts are that first we identify what is known about a specific site. Uh, and to make sure that what, what is known about these, some of these science and technical issues that I just described would get in the hands of the right people so that they could be used to inform the environmental impact statements and be sure that this information is really, really used. But more important than that, what if there are gaps in our knowledge? How do we fill those quickly and in a timely way? So the model has a mechanism to identify what those gaps are. But more important, the model um, has a mechanism for funding that research to, get, uh, to fill the gaps. And they, there are two ways to do that. There's a traditional donor model where um, a donor who's interested in funding a specific project will, will write a check and say, independent researcher with great credentials, please do the research and get it done. Independent, no strings attached. There's another model that uh, we're, we're testing out and it has to do with um, crowdfunding. Now, I'm sure that most of you 
uh, are, you're all familiar with this, this new concept of crowdfunding, but probably more in the, in the context of um, investing in a commercial venture, it's like a film or an album or a restaurant or even um, things like potato salad. And, but there's another part, and you're familiar with organizations like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, but there's another side to crowdfunding called social crowdfunding. And there's a company, a small company, an upstart company started by some, some eager young um, PhDs called experiment.com that focuses on, fund, on crowdfunding for specific research projects. So we're, our model is to team up with them to use their platform for fundraising to fund specific projects. The third part of the model is then when the research is done by independent researchers, with no strings attached, you just do the best possible work by the best possible people, that we then communicate those results to the policymakers. And this is a really important piece of the model because it's not enough for the research to, to be published in a peer-reviewed journal or a, a, um, a special paper and then not, be, not, not get into the hands of the right people. And so our model has an important um, piece for that. So that's the model, three pieces. I, identify, the, uh, identify what's known and what needs to be known, fund the research, and then communicate the results. So every model needs to be tested. And so we decided to test the model right in our own backyard uh, at the proposed site of the Gateway Pacific Terminal. And so we've, we've, uh, we have two projects underway that I'll describe very briefly. Now, all of you who live on Orcas are very familiar with winds. Uh, many of you who've been here over the last couple of days have experienced it directly. And those of you who were here back in December 1989 remember a major uh, wind event where uh, gale force winds came out of the Fraser River Gap across the water uh, and blew down thousands, literally thousands of trees and changed the landscape in certain parts of this island. Uh, and so where we live, uh, it's a very windy place as well. And so we started to think, well, if it's this windy here, what is it like over there? And so we started looking around and my husband found this really incredible data set that um, was gathered by, the, by NOAA. So it turns out that NOAA had wind, has wind detectors over at the terminals and the pier over at Cher the existing facilities at Cherry Point. And there were six years of data, wind data, taken every six minutes. And it was this rich resource of data collected by the federal government that had, was just sitting there. And so we contacted a professor at the University of Washington, familiar to many of you, Cliff Mass, and asked him, he's a, he's a weather, uh, he's a climatologist, and he loves winds and, and this kind of thing. So we asked him if he'd be willing to take a look at these data and, um, and an analyze them for us. So, and so he said, sure, and he worked on the project with a student. And so this is, these are some preliminary results of that. And um, what this representation is, it's called a wind rose. It's a, it's a, a software package that, t that, that uh, was a way to, to demonstrate uh, wind data. So this, pre this preliminary analysis s suggests two things. Number one, there are really strong winter winds coming out of the southeast and out of the northeast. Uh, with the predominant winds, the strongest winds coming from the southeast and, the, and, and then second from the northeast. Now, we started to think, now these data raise a lot of questions, like for example, if you look at the site of the proposed coal piles and you have a lot of wind coming from two predominant directions, where's that coal gonna end up? And so these are the kinds of questions that we, we need to pursue even further, but it shows the power of a small research project that is site-specific and um, important to us. So that's one example. The second example um, has to do with another thing that we worry about here in the, uh, or think about in the Pacific Northwest, which is, which is seismic activity. Uh, we live in a very seismically active area. So it turns out that there are 
some very good scientists, including one who lives here on Orcas Island, Gary Green, who have begun to characterize some new f newly found faults very close to, to us. Uh, one is just north of uh, the North Shore of Orcas Island, be between Orcas and Susha, and the other goes from the northwest to the southeast north, uh, off of Lummi Island. So we thought, but the scientists recognized that these are just preliminary results, and uh, so we decided we would crowdfund a project um, seeking funds from a lot of people who might be interested in this to better characterize these two, this pre this, these preliminary faults with detailed uh, seafloor mapping and sediment sampling to just kind of give more information. So that's what we're in the process of doing our, as our test of the crowdfunding model for uh, the science for the people. So those are two examples. Um, we're testing the model. That's, that's what we're doing. And um, it's an example, a homegrown example that wouldn't have emerged anywhere. If, it wouldn't have emerged, at least for me, if I didn't live on Orcas Island. And, um, but even though it's a, the idea was generated here, um, it's an idea worth spreading, I think, because it's an idea that's applicable anywhere. Um, the idea of best available science is one that we need here, but it's applicable anywhere. And it's an idea that really is in service to our home, this place that we call home, which is the Sailor Sea. But I also think it's an idea that's also in service to the place we all call home, and it's called Research Now. Thank you.